Hello and welcome to SentencingStats.com, your one-stop shop for federal sentencing statistics and analyses. This presentation will provide you with a brief background of the company as well as walking through a sentencing hypothetical to see how our site can be used. So first off, we are a team of PhDs and statisticians as well as me Mark Allenbaugh, a former U.S. Sentencing Commission staffer. We've compiled all the publicly available data files uh, that are published by the U.S. Sentencing Commission onto our website. Uh, that Those constitute uh, approximately, approximately or cover approximately 820,000 defendants. And with our tool now, you can go in and create statistics off that enormous database to determine uh, potentially you know, whether or not a particular plea offer is a good offer or not, uh, help assist your client in negotiating uh, potentially a better uh, plea offer, or use our statistics to determine uh, trial strategies and certainly sentencing strategies, uh, really identify for your client uh, what his or her true exposure might be. Um, also with our data, since we do have data on uh, 5K 1.1 uh, downward departures for cooperation. You could use uh, our, our statistics or our data to determine not only the frequency of such departures, but the degree of such departures uh, to potentially negotiate a better deal with uh, your local prosecutor. And of course, uh, just sentencing mitigation in general to, uh, as we know, as practitioners do know over the last uh, 10 years, uh, certainly since the Booker case in 2005, uh, the, uh, the guidelines not only, of course, are advisory, but the rate and degree of downward variances as a result of 3553A factors has increased dramatically, certainly for some guidelines such as 2G 2.2 as well as 2B 1.1, the fraud guideline. And then, of course, you could use our statistics uh, on appeal to demonstrate substantive unreasonableness. Uh, another area or another use for our uh, web-based tool is for clients to potentially determine or subsequent counsel to determine ineffective assistance of counsel and bring potentially uh, uh, more uh, robust claims when alleging ineffective assistance of counsel. And by ineffective assistance of counsel here, it would be failure to use or to research statistics. As the ABA criminal justice standards for the defense function here articulates, defense counsel's preparation before sentencing should include learning the court's practices and exercising sentencing discretion and the normal pattern of sentences for the offense involved. That clearly, of course, means what do people get for uh, the uh, your client's particular offense? That is something that According to the ABA, defense counsel should know, and we provide that through. We, we provide an easy way for defense counsel uh, to find out and research that uh, with our uh, website. Now, <clears throat> the Second Circuit recently, in United States versus Jenkins, here uh, reversed a within guideline sentence based upon statistics. The court found that a within guideline child pornography sentence, as this was the case here, uh, was substantively unreasonable uh, by citing to the commission statistics. And what's interesting here is that the Second Circuit does acknowledge that in general, a district court need not consult the commission statistics because there is no assurance of comparability. And I'll show you an example of that in a moment. But in that case, the commission statistics were which were readily available to the district court at the time of sentencing, did allow for a meaningful comparison of the defendant's behavior to that of other similarly situated offenders, um, to paraphrase. So <clears throat> the problem with the commission's statistics that are provided on its website, as opposed to the data that we actually analyze, uh, these, uh, uh, what I call the canned reports on the commission's website, do provide a good overview of sentencing trends and perhaps are useful to acad academics looking for general trends overall as well as uh, very helpful to 
uh, policymakers, such as those in Congress, uh, determining uh, how sentencing is trending. Is it trending up? Is it trending down? Uh, and for particular offense categories. But the problem here, and I've, I, I've I, uh, highlighted 2B1.1 here, is that if you were to look at just this guideline and see that the average sentence is 22 months and the median is 12 months, and try to use that statistic alone to say, potentially to a judge, look, Your Honor, uh, a 40-month sentence or what have you is almost double what the average is and over three times as much as the median, um, it would not take a very sophisticated prosecutor to re reply to that and state, well, Your Honor, this statistic alone is meaningless. And that prosecutor would pretty much be right. And the reason why is because th this statistic, the mean of 22 months and the median of 12 months, covers all offenders sentenced under 2B1.1, which means those offenders at any particular offense level, they could have been at a offense level 4, offense level 43. It covers all criminal history categories uh, from 1 through 6, and it also covers those who plead as well as those that went to trial. So within this big group, you have... You don't have apples to apples. You have apples and oranges and grapes and vegetables even. <laughs> all sorts of different offenders all clumped together. And because there is so much variety uh, of offense types as well as offenders and their criminal histories, looking at that statistic alone really is meaningless as suggested by the Second Circuit in uh, the Jenkins case. So how can you get meaningful data? Well. This is what our site provides. So here's a hypothetical case we're going to run through. And you can see um, how at, at the end of this hypothetical, we will have, be able to assess apples to apples in terms of similarly situated offenders. What are they receiving under the uh, scenario that we're going to plug into the website? So let's look at the scenario. So you're, a client walks in and uh, is seeking new counsel. And the, the client has a plea offer on the table of 70 months. It's at the low end of the guideline range. So the plea is to uh, plead to one count of wire fraud, 1343. Uh, obviously, you already know the defendant is going to be sentenced under 2B1.1. Um, the uh, the, uh, the guideline calculation, including... Uh, acceptance of responsibility is already incorporated there, so there's a final offense level of 27. Let's say that's set forth in the plea agreement. Uh, the client has no criminal history, so there's a sentencing range of 70 to 87 months, and as the government often does, uh, the government is willing to stipulate to a bottom of the guideline range, and prior counsel, and of course the government, says, oh, that's a good deal. It's better than 87 months. Well, is 70 months a good deal? Now, if we were to go back to uh, this, what the, the commission offered, it would seem like it's a really bad deal. And I'll give you a hint. It turns out it is a bad deal, but <laughs> not because of, of these statistics. Because if you were to try to use these statistics and go back to the prosecutor to negotiate a better offer, again, a good prosecutor is going to look at these and say, these are meaningless. This is not, doesn't tell me whether 70 months is good or bad. I can tell you that in this district, in the last five cases I've had, re referring to anecdotal evidence, that that is a good deal. But again, what we're concerned about at uh, the federal level is, of course, national disparities. So we want to look nationwide. We don't want to just trust, and the client shouldn't trust, and certainly an attorney shouldn't just trust anecdotal evidence, as, uh, as it were, to determine whether or not a particular offer is a good offer. So here again is the offer, and we're going to assess whether it's good. So you hop on our website, obviously sentencingstats.com, um, and I'm going to kind of speed through this. You've, you've registered now, you've gone to the dashboard, and this will be the first uh, page you're going to see in the case report. So here we enter the defendant's name. This just gives, some, uh, gives the system some uh, uh, baseline information. You can put the docket number in here, the judge, uh, and some demographics about the defendant. 
So once that's in, then we go to the second slide, and we're going to give the, the, uh, the sentencing stats a little bit more information now about the offense. Uh, we have the lead statute here. We're going to uh, plug that in, and we can choose such things as mode of conviction, et cetera. You'll see these little, uh, uh, these little switches here. You can turn those on and off. If you turn them on, it actually narrows down. It filters on that particular uh, uh, on that particular variable. So if we just wanted to see only those individuals who are convicted, their lead statute of conviction was 18 U.S.C. 1343, then we would turn this on. Or if we were only interested in those that pled guilty, we would turn this on. For our purposes, we're going to keep it off for right now. Um, and then here, we're going to finish putting in some sentencing information. We select the guideline. We're going to select our final offense level, which you can turn on or off. But here, we really want to look at similarly situated, or what I prefer to say is identically situated defendants. And these, all these defendants are identically, identically situated for purposes of the guidelines. In other words, all relevant variables here have been identified uh, and would match our scenario for purposes of evaluating the, uh, the, the sentence outcome. So we're going to select the final offense level of 27. We're going to turn that on so it filters by it. And we're also going to assume that our client is in criminal history one. So we're going to turn that on. This way it eliminates all the criminal histories, twos, threes, fours, and five. So all we're looking at now uh, in the data are those individuals between 2006 and 2016 sentenced under 2B1.1, the final offense level 27, and a criminal history category of 1. And we can see up here in the case summary that there are 671 of those individuals nationwide, 101 in the Ninth Circuit. We had selected the Central District of California, which of course is in the Ninth Circuit. And in our district, the Central District of California that I selected, there are 40 uh, in, in individuals that have been sentenced that meet, that meet these parameters. Now, one of the parameters they didn't select, which would have reduced this somewhat, again, is I could have just focused on those that, that pled. Uh, but here, for whatever reason, you may not be interested in that, so we're just going to keep that out for the time being. We're just focusing now on the offense level, the guideline, and the criminal history category. Now, 70 months was the suggested sentence that, or the, the, the offered sentence that the government was offering to stipulate to. So let's see if that's a good sentence or not. And that's what we, we select here is the target sentence. And you'll see this will pop up on the, a, a table and a chart. And you'll see what happens here with the, that 70 month sentence. It's going to compare that 70 month sentence to the universe of defendants that we've, um, uh, that we've selected. So here we're going to go now to the next page. This is the last page now in the uh, case wizard where you can select your data output, the charts that you want. And so what we're going to select here are uh, the median and average charts. You can select a cumulative, uh, which uh, groups all the data together from 2006 to 2016. In other words, all 671 sentences will be grouped together and the median will be determined by, from that on a national circuit and district level. You could select just national or just circuit or just district or all three of them or any combination if you wanted to. And then here is a, uh, the average sentence. We're going to select a trend. Uh, and that will report over the last... Um, uh, since 2006, what the average has been by year. So you can see, has it been trending up or trending down? You could also select cumulative there if you wanted. So then on our, uh, so, uh, excuse me. So once we finish here, we're going to select some guidelines compliance charts and some degree of departure charts. Uh, for, for brevity's sake, we're going to skip over how to do that and you'll just see what the output is here. So you select some parameters in these charts, and then we get to the output, the actual case report for our defendant, John Doe, who walked in and is looking for a second opinion. And again, the issue is, is 70 months a good deal? Well, here, as you can see, it doesn't look so good. Um, <clears throat> a 70-month sentence is in the 64.2nd percentile. 
that means that it is greater than 64.2% of all similarly situated defendants in this group, that 612, or the 671 defendants. It's greater than almost two-thirds of the sentences imposed. We can see here on a national level that the average sentence was uh, 52 months and the median was 58. Uh, less even at the Ninth Circuit level, so within your circuit, uh, this, uh, the uh, sentences are not as severe, again, for identically situated defendants. And then finally, at the district level, in your district, there, it, uh, the, the output's even better. So out of those 40 defendants uh, that matched our parameters, the average sentence was 41 months and the median was only 43 months. So now we can see what some of the output looks like. And as you recall, we selected uh, to have a cumulative output for the median sentences. So this is something that you could use as an exhibit, for example, in your sentencing memorandum. This would illustrate to the court that at the national level here in the blue, the, uh, the national median was 58, the circuit median was 50, and the district median was 43. But what the plea agreement's asking for is for a 70-month sentence, which is way the heck up here. Uh, another way, of course, is we, we also selected the national um, uh, average or the, uh, the average sentence on a nationwide scale uh, by year. This is a trend chart. And as you can see, it's kind of gone up and down over the last uh, 11 years with last year, um, uh, last year being 56 months. That was the average sentence for, for uh, our uh, group of 671 individuals. Uh, obviously, not all 671 were sentenced there in 2016, but it was out of that group. Out of that, the nationwide group, those that were sentenced in 2016, their average sentence was 56 months, which is up a bit from 2015, as we can see, uh, which is below what it was in 2014. So, you know, the point is it's not quite as steady, um, but uh, nonetheless, it's still all, all years have been well below the 70 month guideline or suge suggested sentence. And we can see here, this is what the average sentences have looked like um, in a trend chart uh, for the Ninth Circuit with last year ending at 39 months. And for the District of California over the last 11 years, we can see that last year it was 29 months. Uh, as the number of uh, offenders in a particular group grow smaller, of course the charts tend to be uh, a lot less uh, uniform or there's a lot more variability uh, in the charts and that's what you're seeing here because as you may recall there were only a total of 40 over 11 years uh, that were in uh, our, our selected parameter. So which means there's only about uh, you know, three, roughly three or four defendants each year so that uh, that explains the high variability here. But certainly, so out of these charts, it's probably better to rely, uh, best to rely on the national average here, even though it's not as, um, uh, as good, or you can still rely on the, the, the Ninth Circuit one, but uh, the Ninth Circuit, just remember, you're only dealing with 101 uh, defendants there overall. At any rate, um, now we can also look at departures. Um, there, let's say that there may be an opportunity for your client to cooperate um, and the prosecutor's being a little, uh, uh, is disinclined to extend a cooperation agreement. Well, one thing that you could point out here that if the, you know, that to, to the prosecutor and potentially the judge is that in over a third of cases last year of identically situated cases, uh, a downward to, uh, a motion a 5k 1.1 motion was filed on behalf of the government for cooperation and when cooperation when those motions were granted uh, the the average the uh, the the average percent below the bottom of the guideline range was pretty high at 56.5 percent in other words when judges did decide to depart uh, for a 5K motion, they reduced the sentence by over 50% off the bottom of the guideline range. In other words, they reduced it by over half. 
when they did decide to reduce. So going to 5K can be uh, rather, uh, rather helpful. And these statistics are especially helpful if you happen to be in a district where the practice of that district is to not ask a judge for a particular amount off the guideline range. Uh, districts uh, can vary quite a bit in terms of their 5K 1.1 policy. Some districts will, will routinely grant or move for two to three levels off. Others will move for a percent off. Others will leave it wide open and just say, judge, it's up to you. So especially in those districts, uh, this will give your judge some sense of how high judges are going when they decide to depart. Not for fraudsters in general, let's say, but for people that are identical or nearly identical to your client. And that helps, of course, to avoid unwarranted disparity. Now, looking at judge-initiated downward variances, we can see some variability here. Uh, but uh, generally, there's been a trend up, except for last year, uh, there was a marked um, downward trend where only 19%, 19.1% of defendants received a judge-initiated downward variance. The judge-initiated downward variance is kind of a mouthful, but it's basically your 3553A downward variance. So a judge deciding to use his or her own discretion to sentence below the guideline range without a 5K. So you can see this has been rather, it's been a rather popular, uh, this scenario, those sentenced under 2B1.1 with final offense level 27, criminal history 1, have often received downward variances uh, up until 2015, and then there was a marked declination. That may be explained uh, by the increased rate here of downward departures. We can see that the 5Ks uh, went up significantly from 2014. This is something else that you can help explain and help counsel understand trends that may be going on nationwide, circuit-wide, or even district-wide. And so finally, um, this final chart gives you a, a, a look at the percent below the guidelines that judges go when they do decide to vary. Um, again, as we saw up here, uh, variances have generally been going up except for last year where they dropped, uh, most likely as a result of an increase in 5Ks. But when judges do decide to vary downward, this chart tells us how far down they're going. And it's been rather significant until last year where uh, when judges did exercise um, their discretion to vary below the guidelines, which they did in 19.1% of the cases, when, in those 19.1% of the cases when they did vary, uh, they, the, uh, they vary below the guideline range by almost a quarter uh, of, 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 uh, of the bottom of the guideline range of the 70 months. So um, that wraps up our uh, hypothetical here. So when we look at, is 70 months a good deal? Hmm, probably not. Again, the 70 months, as we learned by using our statistics, um, or using, excuse me, is using the commission's data, but using our tool to evaluate the commission's data. We found that 70 months is in the 64.2nd percentile, which means it's higher than nearly two thirds of all identically situated defendants. And again, we're looking at identically situated defendants, or if you don't like the term identically situated, then very similarly situated. Certainly much more meaningful than the canned reports that one can receive the commission's website. The mean, the nationwide, the mean or average sentence was 52 months and the median was 58 months, but we know that in the Ninth Circuit and in our district, they were even lower. And, uh, you know, an average is just an average. It doesn't mean that's the sentence that the defendant should get. You could use now any other mitigating factors that your, your client may have to uh, uh, argue for an even lower sentence, something below uh, the, the mean or certainly the median. Uh, we learned about the rate and the degree of 5K 1.1 departures. Uh, those were not insignificant. Over a quarter of similarly situated uh, defendants are getting the 5Ks. Uh, and when they do get a 5K, they're getting well over a half off their sentence reduced. And the rate of judge-initiated departures, a little bit of an anomaly last year. We saw a drop. Uh, that could be explained by other factors. 
Uh, but nonetheless, when uh, judges are varying below the guidelines, while they're not going down as much as they do for a cooperation deal, they're still going down a significant amount by almost a quarter off the bottom of the guideline range of uh, 70 months. So that's around, I think, 17 and a half months uh, would constitute nearly a 25% uh, reduction off the bottom of the guideline range. So that will wrap up our uh, presentation. Uh, I hope you take the opportunity to use our site, uh, play around with the data, and of course if you have any questions we're always here to, to answer them. Thank you very much.